Hello everyone, welcome to Hot Seat. I'm Omid Moradas from Tehran, and once again, I'm so grateful to be with you all from this educational platform. And I have to say, I'm very proud and very happy that so many great friends and amazing educators from around the world accepted the invitation to join us in the hot seat and provide you with the latest materials in the field of perio implant reconstruction. And today, again, I'm so excited. I told him before we start that a dear friend and the, one of the master clinicians, I think all of you know this guy, Jose Carlos Martina da Rosa is here with us from Brazil. Hello, Jose. Welcome to Hot Seat. Hello. So, so happy to have you with us, my friend. And as I said, it's truly honor and pleasure to have a, one of the true educators and uh, I can say honest teachers in the field of perio and implant with us and it means a lot and I'm pretty sure all the audience will enjoy your amazing comprehensive presentation which I'm personally a great fan of this technique and uh, I will not talk about it much because I'm pretty sure you will go in depth so I will keep it for a little bit a secret for them so they will be able to discover exactly what is going on. So as you all know, over the past sessions, we talked about importance of flap management, aesthetics, the techniques in hard tissue reconstruction, in soft tissue reconstruction. And speaking of extraction sockets, speaking of some cases that really doesn't follow the very basic principles, we have some challenges. We, we, we face many, many techniques, many, many ideas. And most important thing in the eyes, in the mind of the clinician is to be predictable and do it as easiest way as possible. In, for instance, when we are facing the heat senses, when we are facing type two sockets, type three sockets, uh, it's a challenge to choose a proper technique, an easy technique and also predictable technique. Do you want to go with membranes? Do you want to go with the stage approaches? Do you want to reflect the flap, not reflect the flap? So these are the kind of things that usually are main questions in our mind when we are dealing with the treatment plans. And today's presentation, I'm pretty sure, will bring you another view of how to decide to treat a case in a predictable way. And it's like a combo. So you can do everything very, very predictable and in not many stages, maybe in one or two. So the title of today's presentation is Immediate Dental Alveolar Restoration Technique, abbreviation IDR, which I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with this technique. And um, my dear friend Jose is gonna present it for us. So as a tradition, I will have Jose's CV for all of you, and then we straightly go to the presentation. I don't wanna talk too much, pretty sure you all are waiting for this amazing presentation and at the end we will have a brief discussion on the topic. So Jose graduated uh, in dentistry from Federal University of Santa Maria, UFSM Santa Maria, Brazil in 1988. A specialty course in periodontics, so um, it was in APCD Boru, SP Brazil in 1991. A specialty course and Master of Science in Prosthesis, CPO, Sao Leopoldo Mandic, Campinas, Brazil, 2005, and PhD in Implantology again from Sao Leopoldo Mandic, Campinas, Brazil, in 2014. Author of the book Immediate Dental Alveolar Reconstruction Restoration by Quintessence Publishing, which I truly recommend you all to read this book and it's one of the best sellers by Quintessence. And also he has a private practice in Coxias School in Brazil. Once again, with a pleasure, my dear friend, the platform is all yours and really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, thank you so much, Amit. Uh, first of all, I would like to say many thanks 
for for you for your kind invitation and your kind words kind introduction so first of all i would like to say many thanks for your kind invitation and introduction it's a great pleasure uh, to share with you today my experience more than 13 years of experience working with it on this topic in media dental valar restoration and i am the developer of the, this technique and i've been giving lecture all around the world about this topic and today the main focus of my lecture will be uh, the application of the immediate dental valar restoration technique in aesthetic zone uh, in very challenging clinical case as you said before this is my office here in brazil place that i am right now uh, inside this building we have seven chairs we have my surgical center i also have my image center my planning center uh, and my my study center and i usually give my courses, three-day IDR courses, several times a year in my office. Uh, I would like to say many thanks to the IDR team that is formed by my wife, uh, Ariadne Pertili Rosa, and two partners, Marcos Fadanelli and Luis Antonio Violin. These are the people who helped me to spread the IDR technique around, around the world. Uh, here you, you can see two different scenarios, a post extraction socket and a dentulo side, side by side. And we have huge difference, talk about the, the dimensions of these two different areas. And according to my experience, a post extraction socket would never become an edentulo site for late implantation. It's because it would increase the number of the procedures, the cost and the treatment time, and of course, the unpredictable of the outcomes talk about the gingival margin and the papillary height position. This is why I recommend you, regardless of the extension of the bone defect, that everything is gonna be solved in one single procedure using flapless surgery. We never open the flap in order to rebuild the socket. Mm -hmm. Just to keep in mind that the dentist is responsible for the decision making, not the patient. And the second premolar, uh, as you can see, it's missing completely the buccal wall, for scenarios like this, uh, the IDR technique fits perfectly because it, it's, all, it, it's all based on biological response. It's a bone grafting at the time of immediate implant placement and pro provisionalization in compromised alveolar sockets. And everything is gonna be solved in one single procedure without open flap. This is the immediate dental valve restoration concept. This is a minimally invasive approach. This is a flapless surgery, but all credit is go to the mother nature. We take advantage of our bone biology. We harvest the graft from the tuberosity using handle tools, handle instruments like chisels, and we use this piece of bone, a double layer graft, a cortical cancellous graft in order to restore the wall that the patient had lost. And we also use particulate bone harvest from the same donor area in order to fill the gaps. But what's the importance of using a graft as a natural scaffold filled with osteoblastic cells and growth factors? Here you can see in the image in the left, the bone loss, it's missing completely the buccal wall. But the question is, why not to use a piece of bone as a new buccal wall, a new bone wall, as a biological membrane in order to prevent cells competition between hard and soft tissue. The main goal of using this approach is to have a, res a result like this, a bulky soft tissue along the months and especially along the years. This is what we were looking for for such a long time. And here you can see the CBCT scan after 10 years, make a comparison how everything started. I wanna call your attention not only the thickness and the height of the bone reconstructed. But take a look at the amount of bone that was remodeled over the implant platform. This is quite common when we apply this technique and we follow this protocol. 
Let's carry on talk about donor graft area for the execution of the IDR technique. Here you can see this is what we do. We, we are just moving bone from the tuberose to, to the receptor site that can be used in an intact socket as a bone filler or in compromised socket doing a bone reconstruction. And we use this piece of bone as a bone transplantation. A lot of viable cells, DNPs, growth factors, ready to be transplanted from the donor side to the receptor side. So we are going to promote the bone growth and of course to expect a faster bone grafting incorporation. In three months we can finish the case. But it's always recommend, recommend to you a quick manipulation. As soon as you take the bone from the tuberosity, we reshape the bone according to the defect configuration using a rounder and immediately after that, we install the graft in the receptor site with the cortex turned toward to the receptor, the cortex turned toward to the inner part of soft tissue and the marrow portion to the implant body. But why we do it? In order to maintain the cell's vitality in the graft from the donor area to the recipient bed. And how about the IDR science, the IDR based on evidence? We have already published 26 articles about this topic. The first article was published in 2008. Since then, we have published many articles in different journals around the world. In our book, as Omid said before, uh, it was published in partnership with uh, Quint Quintessence Publishing. It was launched in Portuguese, Spanish, English, and Mandarin languages. But before we go uh, one step further, I would like to discuss a little bit about this topic. This is, one, this is one of the most important topics in order to succeed with this technique and many other techniques uh, to replace tooth from the socket. How about the gap dimensions to be left between the inner part of soft tissue and the outer surface of the implant? Here you can see different scenarios, regardless of the tooth to be replaced from the central incisor to the second molar. And we have different socket configuration and how to select the implant diameter in very different situations like this. And we can select narrow, regular or wide platform. But based on what? We always use the buccal palatal distance of the socket in order to select the implant diameter. This is an example of using this protocol. Here you can see uh, in this patient, this patient had a problem in the left central incisor and we have to replace this left central incisor. This is a, a young woman, very demanding about aesthetics. Uh, and this is the article that was published in 2014. This is the first article in the international literature that uh, guide you in order to select the implant diameter in the anterior zone, always expecting a gap around three millimeters. And we can use as a reference, uh, a stone cast or a soft tissue CBCT scan, as you can see here. You, can, you may have more information reading this article. As you can see here, uh, the soft tissue CBCT scan, we can measure the inner part of the soft tissue from the buckle to the palatal aspect, and the implant has to be inserted always in the palatal wall anchorage, expecting a gap at the buccal aspect. This is a, a virtual planning, a prosthetically driven digital planning, and we can not only to plan the implant, but also the gap to be left between the implant, between the implant and the inner part of soft tissue prior to the surgery. And as, as you can see here, we have already performed the IDR technique and we, we harvest bone from the tuberosity. As you can see, we have a gap around three millimeters completely uh, filled. This is the middle post stop. We made the, our provisional restoration using the same crown from the patient. And this is the post stop after three months, after hard and soft tissue is being, is being healed. You can see in the image on the right, the bone graft that we had placed over the implant platform still remain and remodel over the implant platform. And take a look at this square that we call a magic square. Let's go a little bit deeper about this topic. And let's explain 
a little bit better. What does it mean, these four sides of this square? First of all, and the most important one is the 3D implant position. It's represented to the red color. Second, the three millimeters in thickness of the, the new buckle bone wall. Three millimeters, this is the distance of the implant to be placed in the coronal apical position. And we always expect to have, a, to have three or more millimeters in thickness, talk about soft tissue thickness. This is the magic square, but the main number is three. Let's come back to the clinical case. You can see the perimplantar tissue and we can make a comparison uh, using a soft tissue CBCT scan or the clinical image. You can see the, the thickness of soft tissue around this implant. This is amazing. And this is the post-op three years, three years after we installed the final restoration. You can see the maintenance of volume of soft tissue and the maintenance of the anatomical contour and the papillary height. But we always use the buccal palatal distance of the socket in order to select the correct implant diameter. This rule is, is very simple and can be applied in all the situations that you can face, upper, down, anterior, or posterior, talk about compromised sockets or intact socket. When this distance is less than seven millimeters, the implant to be selected should be narrow platform. When this distance is equal to seven millimeters, we would select four millimeters diameter, regular platform. When this distance is more than seven millimeters, the implant to be selected should be wide platform. It's around five millimeters diameter. This rule, we've been working with this protocol for at least nine years. So this is the clinical case that I would like to share with you today that we consider very challenged, very challenging, uh, especially when we talk about the modern implantology. And uh, in the six different clinical situations, we can apply different protocol and its application. In the first one, we have the maintenance of the leveling of gingival margin in combination with the bone loss. In the second one, we have two central incisors condemned to be extracted in combination with bone loss here and bone loss here. Total loss of the buccal wall. The third one, you can see the combination with gingival recession and the bone loss. The fourth one, you can see the gingival recession, the infection plus the bone loss. Number five, you can see that in this case, it's missing completely the papilla. There is no crystal bone, but we have the combination with bone loss at the facial aspect in both sides, both center incisor. And the last, this is a nightmare. You can see a large change recession and it looks like that both, both teeth, uh, central and lateral incisor are condemned to be distracted. Let's see one, one by one, these different clinical situations. First of all, Let's start talking about case that the patient had total loss of buccal bone wall. And here you have two different scenarios. Uh, the, the leveling of gingival margin, as you can see here, and we have an even of gingival margin. But the question is, which is the treatment of choice in cases with buccal bone loss? According to the literature, we may have many uh, ways to manage cases like this. Number one, we can do the tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR using biomaterial in combination with connective tissue graft using a flap surgery. We reflect the flap in order to do it all, all the bone reconstruction in combination with implant installation, not, doesn't matter, but we can stage. Number two, the tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR using biomaterial plus CT graft, uh, connective tissue graft using a flap plus surgery. Number three, we can do tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR plus CT, <coughs> CT uh, graft plus immediate provisionalization using flap surgery. Number four, tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR plus CT graft 
plus immediate provisionalization in the opposite way, in a blind edge surgery using a flapless surgery. Number five, tooth extraction plus implant plus bone reconstruction. Take a look, autogenous bone from ramus plus immediate provisionalization using flapless surgery. And number six, tooth extraction plus implant plus bone reconstruction using autogenous bone from the tuberosity plus immediate provisionalization using flapless surgery. And take a look at from number four to number six, from number three to number six, we always using, uh, sorry, from number four to number six, we always using flapless surgery. But what we have in common, uh, evaluate these six types of uh, planning. In all of them, we still need autogenous graft, either hard or soft tissue graft. Let's take a look uh, on the literature. Number one, tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR plus CT graft using a flapless surgery. That Danny Buzier, um, he has been doing it for such a long time. This is the most uh, useful technique based on the literature around the world. But if you see this article that was published a couple of years uh, before uh, by Coleman and his team, they said that the combined GBR and CT graft procedure may only partially compensate for buccal bone deficiencies. Second option, tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR using biomaterial plus CT graft using flapless surgery. This is what Stefan Chui and Danny Starno uh, suggested for us uh, in type uh, two defects to A, B, or C using uh, a, a ice cream cone technique plus biomaterial plus connective tissue graft. Number three, tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR, CT graft plus middle provisionalization using flap surgery. This is what Dr. Kahn, Joseph Kahn, suggested us in 2017 to open a flap, a large, a large uh, flap like this in order to do the reconstruction using the uh, biomaterial plus membrane plus CT graft plus the flap position in the coronal direction. But you can see that when we follow this protocol, we may have some, some unpredictable, we'll talk about the gingival margin or papillary height position. And we also have the presence of the scars in the front of Zor. The number four, the tooth extraction plus implant plus GPR, CT graft plus immediate provisionalization using flap, flapless surgery. This article was published last year, but the, the threshold value of seven, seven, around seven millimeters that, can be, that we can face from the buckle to the palatal aspect in order to apply this, tech, this methodology. And they suggested only to use implants with the diameter around 3.5 millimeters, but they, they didn't mention why they only use this kind of diameter. But the follow-up follow is very short follow-up. You can see here uh, it's around 12 months. But in another, in another article that was published uh, last year by uh, Dr. Cecilia and, and his team from Spain, they evaluate seven years post-op and they use autogenous bone graft plus bovine bone mineral. But they said in the conclusion that the clinicians should be aware that one to two millimeters of gingival recession can be observed. Number five, the tooth extraction plus implant plus bone reconstruction using autogenous bone from the ramus plus immediate provisionalization. Uh, this article was published from Dr. Noelkin and his team, and they use uh, only autogenous bone ships in order to fill the gaps or to do the bone reconstruction. Ships that can be harvested from the mandibular ramus or the particulate and particulate in a bone mill or collecting bone particles by a disposable filter. But combining the success criteria established by Buzzer with the criteria of bone loss is smaller or equal to one millimeter, the cumulative success rate according to the second endpoint was 70%.
And this is what we are discussing today. The IDR technique, the tough extraction, implant, bone reconstruction, bone from the tuberosis plus immediate provisionalization without open flap, without connected tissue graft. And you can see in this research, uh, we evaluate 20 clinical cases and we apply this methodology, always leaving a gap around three millimeters at the buccal aspect after before and after bone reconstruction. And after four months, we can see the maintenance of the anatomical contour. And we evaluate the most important area of the implant, the cervical area, and we evaluate the bone instability in a mean of follow-up of three years. And we evaluate the bone instability up to the implant platform, letter C, two millimeters above letter D, as you can see here, and four millimeters above letter E. This article was published in 2016 by the International Journal of Parodontics and Restorative Dentistry. Let's see the IDR and its application in many clinical cases. Let's start talk about case that the patient has the leveling of gingival margin using cord cook and cellulose graft. In this patient, this patient uh, came to us uh, several years ago and she presented the right central incisor condemned to be extracted. She had an accident and she tried to save this tooth, but she did not succeed. In combination with a gingival recession, sorry, in combination with bone loss, what we did, we extracted tooth, applying minimally invasive procedures. We confirmed the total loss of the buccal wall. We stalled the implant, the palatal wall anchorage, and we left a gap around three millimeters as we usually do. We, make, we made our provisional restoration using the same crown from the patient. And you can see here, we check this provisional restoration over the implant. And we left here intentionally this anatomical contour, this under contour in the buccal aspect and the proximal areas in the mesial and the digital aspect, uh, what we call this space as a soft tissue gap, STG or soft tissue gap. Mm -hmm. uh, this protocol, we've been working with this methodology for more than 13 years. To harvest bone graft from the tuberosity, we need previously a clinical assessment, an X-ray, and the CBCT, CBCT scan from this donor area. And these are the tools, the IDR chisels that we use to harvest bone from the tuberosity, as you can see. And the chisel has to be placed as perpendicular as possible to the bone structure, and right after to go deepen approximately one or two millimeters, we change the angulation of the chisel according to the defect size and width. And we follow the planted length. As soon as we fracture the bone, as you can see here, the cortical cancellus wrap that can be used in order to restore the buccal wall that the patient had lost. And we also match the cervical portion of the graft with the outline of gingival margin in order to restore the bone architecture. And it's necessary to harvest more bone in order to be crushed and filled. As you can see here, after this bone is completely packed, particulate bone, we left bone graft over one millimeter over the implant platform. And we installed the provisional restoration, of course, out of occlusion. The occlusion was protected uh, from the neighboring teeth. What happened with the soft tissue? We changed. So as you can see here, we have the coronal displacement of soft tissue. The soft tissue have been moved in the coronal direction. So after three months to push the soft tissue in the apical direction, uh, we added composite resin every once a week for two or three weeks, maybe half millimeters every week. After we got it, we have the leveling of gingival margin. We removed the screw retainer provisional restoration and we evaluated maintenance of the papillary height and of course, the maintenance of the volume of soft tissue. It was taken the impression, it made the final abutment, uh, an IMAX abutment, a customized abutment, and we cement the final restoration, <clears throat> the porcelain restoration. And here, the clinical and the CBCT post-op after six years. What can we notice here? We have the maintenance of the anatomical contour of soft tissue, and so soft tissue has been held in the same position due to the presence of the bone graft, as you can see here. So I can state that if we have around three millimeters of bone at the buccal aspect, we do not need to compensate with soft tissue graft. This is an 
an article that was published in 2014 uh, by my group. Uh, and we did a clinical research. We evaluate 18 cases. All cases presented total loss of buccal wall, and we performed the IDR technique in a mean of follow-up of 58 months. And according to our finds, no recession occurred during the evaluated period, and the mean mesopopular level and gistopopular level is likely increased over time. Let's increase the degree of the difficulty. How about case that present a small ginger recession using cortical cancellous rod? Let's follow this case. In this case, we have two hopeless stiff, the right and the left central incisor. But the right, in the right side, we have a ginger recession around 1.5 millimeters in height. And this patient had a thin periodontal biotype. When we, take this, we took the CBCT scan, we noticed that the patient lost the buccal wall in both central incisor, the right and the left. And what are the limitations of using bone graft from the tuberosity to change the soft tissue in the coronal direction? We decided to start for the left side, number 21. As you can see, the loss of the buccal wall. And we, we extract the tooth, we insert the implant, and you can see here it, the total loss of the buccal wall. We harvest bone graft from the tuberosity. We reshape the graft according to the different configuration, and we also match the cervical portion of the graft with the gingival margin contour, and we fully fill these gaps with particulate bone, as you can see here, harvest from the same donor area, of course. And in this case, we weren't expecting any change in the soft tissue in the coronal direction. This is why it was promoted here a gingival ceiling in the provisional restoration. Let's understand a little bit more deeply what we did. Here we have uh, an illustration. The implant was a red performance in the palatal wall anchorage. We made, uh, we made our provisional restoration with idea emergence profile and we use a buccal cortical cancellous bone graft to restore the buccal wall and a particulate bone graft to promote the bone filling. And as I said before, we left intentionally what we call a soft tissue gap or STG that's going to be filled with blood clot uh, in a few minutes. Blood that comes from the remaining periosteum uh, from the graft and from the socket. After three months, everything was going very well with the left side, as you can see here, and we decided to treat the right side. The periodontal pocket was about eight millimeters length. As you can see here, the total loss of the buccal wall. And we struck the tooth, we confirmed the loss of the buccal wall, we insert the implant in the palatal approach, and we left a gap around three millimeters at the buccal aspect. We harvest bone graft from the tuberosity, and I want to call your attention to the graft vascularization, as you can see here. Fully fill these gaps with particulate bone, as you can see here. And we left bone graft one millimeter over platform. What we did different, make a comparison on the right and the left side. In the left side, the implant was placed at three millimeters from gingival margin apical direction. In the right side, as we have a gingival recession around 1.5 millimeter, we, the implant was placed at 1.5 millimeter from the gingival margin apical direction. And how about the bone graft? The bone graft was placed at just half millimeters from gingival margin apical direction. And we performed the correct anatomical contour of the provisional restoration following the gingival margin uh, of the opposite side. And we left what we call a soft tissue gap. This article uh, is going to be published very soon. The importance of soft tissue gap to obtain long-term pair implant tissue stability in post extraction sockets. And we collect blood from the tuberosity and use the syringe. And we inject this blood in order to fit completely this area from the cervical, uh, the anatomical contour of gingival margin in the cervical area of the provisional restoration. And we wait five minutes until we got the blood clot and we send the patients home. After three months, we had the coronal displacement of soft tissue. So we removed the two provisional restoration 
And what can we notice here? The biological width was retrieved. We have in both sides three millimeters from gingival margin. So I can say that more important than one abutment one time is the thicker soft tissue every time. This is what we were looking for, to have uh, the new buck wall with a relevant thickness and a soft tissue thicker than the beginning. We took the impression and we made the final restorations. This is the follow-up after seven years. You can see that the maintenance of the thickness of the bone grafted and the bone graft that we, it was placed over the implant platform still remain and remodel over the implant platform. So we got hard tissue stability. Just make a comparison, just to keep in mind how everything started. It was missing the buckle wall in both central incisors. And this is the follow-up after nine years. Now, we have three main topics to be evaluated in the soft tissue. We have to evaluate the maintenance of the color, the texture, and the volume of soft tissue. So I can say that we got soft tissue stability. And how about cases that the patient presented large gingival recession, as you can see in this case? It's cases like this, it's mandatory to use a triple graft. It's a little bit different than the other graft that we discussed before, because this graft has connective tissue along with cortical cancellous graft in one single piece. So here we have our problem. We have the gingival recession. We have the total loss of the buccal wall. And what would you do to manage heart and soft tissue damage? According to the literature, number one, we can do the tooth extraction plus implant plus GBR uh, plus CT graft, connective tissue graft using flap flapless surgery. This is the most well-known uh, procedure. Number two, tooth extraction plus implant plus four layer graft harvest from the tuberose using flapless procedures, much better than the first one. And the number three, the tooth extraction plus implant plus a triple graft harvest from the maxillary tuberosity plus immediate provisionalization. That means everything is gonna be solved in one single shot. But what these three kinds of treatment have in common? In all of them, we need autogenous tissues. Either using co connective tissue or, or uh, bone tissue. Type one, uh, tooth extraction implant plus GBR, uh, as Chidman Koo uh, suggested for us for such a long time. Implant installation, bone reconstruction, uh, membrane plus soft tissue graft. Or maybe we can use this methodology that was published by Dr. Juan Zufia from Spain uh, two years ago. He suggested to use the tooth extraction plus implant plus a four layer graft harvest from the tuberose using a flapless surgery. Here you can see what he does. This is the, the, three, the four layer graft. It's gonna be inserted very gentle in, into the socket and it's going to be stable using sutures at the end of the vestibule and the sutures in to fill the socket. We have the epithelium right here. Here you can see the epithelium. So this is the pre and post-op. You can see the, the final outcomes and you can see also the new book of all completely remodeled. And he staged, but he, he had a very good outcome. And why not to, to do it all in one single procedure? This is the first article in the international literature that, that uh, recommend you to do uh, the heart and soft tissue reconstruction uh, in one single step. It was published in 2009. We are talking about 11 years ago. This is another article that was published by my team in 2014 by Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. And we, in this article, we release all about the protocol, the step from the step one to the last step of the idea, our technique using a triple graph. Let's come back to the clinical case. Let's see what we did. Here we have the hopeless tooth is the right center incisor. We have a gingival recession around four millimeters. This is a patient with, that presents a high lip line, no buckle wall, 
what we did. In this case, we did four incisions, two, inc two incisions at the papillary level, two horizontal incisions, plus two more divergent incisions following the gingival recession pattern. You can see here how, how thin the soft tissue is. You can see through the gingival the periodontal probe. As we have a gingival recession around four, as you can see here, the implant was placed one millimeter from gingival margin in the coronal direction at the, at the an enamel cement junction of the neighboring tooth. And we performed the provisional restoration and we left an under contour in the, the, the buccal and the proximal areas. To harvest a triple graft from the tuberosis, we need, we need to evaluate clinically, hydrographically, and tomographically. Through a soft tissue BCT scan, we can accurately measure the height and width of soft tissue available plus the height and width of hard tissue available. Let's see this step by step how we take the triple graft from the tuberosity. We usually do three incisions that you can follow through this illustration what we are doing to, in, in the video. The first incision has to be placed parallel to the distal aspect of the last molar, plus two more perpendicular incisions touching the crystal bone. The step two, we do the flap division, leaving a connective tissue layer covering the bone. What's next? The step three, the steatomy, we use uh, a straight chisel, the flat one, and the chisel has to be placed as perpendicular as possible to the bone extruder. Right after to go deep and approximately three millimeters, we change the angulation of the chisel, leaving parallel to the outer surface of the soft tissue in order to remove a uniform layer of the triple graft. After going to the planar length, we fracture the bone. What is missing? It's missing now just to release the connective part of the triple graft. This is why we are doing here. And here you can see the triple graft, a three layer graft. As you can see here, right after it was taken from the tuberosity. But how we deal with this graft? The ideal position is obtained leaving uh, the connective tissue turned towards to the soft tissue and the marrow portion to the implant body. But in between, it, it's recommended to insert particulate bone in order to cover the experience exposures of the implant. So here we are seeking the right position of the triple graft. And take a look that one stitch was enough to hold the graft in the right position, plus two more stitches in each papilla. And we level the gingival margin according to the gingival margin of the contralateral side. After four months, the biological width was retrieved. Now you can see the three millimeters from gingival margin. So it was taken impression, made the final abutment. In this case, we use a procedural abutment, but pay attention to the, the anatomical contour, very similar in both sides of this gingival margin. And the final restoration, the final ceramic crowns after we did the cementation. And here you can see, make a comparison during the surgery and four months later, we have the biotype conversion. We had a thin biotype. Now you can see a thick biotype. This is the final outcomes. You can see the maintenance of gingival margin and the popular height position. Just take a look how everything started. We have a breakdown in the statics. Now you can see the balance between the lips, the gingival tattoo, and the crowns. And this is the post-op after 10 years. We still have the new buckle ball wall completely stable right here. This is another uh, case that uh, I would like to share with you. This patient presents the gingival recession, the bone loss, plus the infection. And you can see through this 3D image, the big size of the defect. What we did here, we did the prototyping. Over the prototyping, we can measure the height and width of the heart tissue, the bone defect. So we extract the tooth, we, we confirm the total loss of the buccal wall, we insert the implant, and we harvest the triple graft from the tuberosity, the triple graft plus particulate bone. And we reshape the graft according to the defect configuration, and we match the graft according to the defect configuration over the prototyping. And we insert the graft in the receptor site, 
and take a look that we have the triple graft here plus particulate bond right here, and we install our provisional restoration immediately, we will left part of the soft tissue exposed. There is no problem here, right here. In three months, we have the soft and hard tissue completely healed. It was taken impression and made the final restoration. And you can see here the maintenance of the anatomical contour of soft tissue. This is the CBCT scan that was taken after three years. Make a comparison how everything started. And now before and after, and again, we have, we have here the biotype conversion. We started with an extremely thin periodontal biotype and now we have, we have a thick biotype. So this is the follow-up after five years. You can see the maintenance of the gingival margin papilla height position and maintenance of volume of soft tissue. And take a look at this CBCT scan that was taken after five years. We have the new buccal wall and the completely stable in thickness and the thickness of soft tissue. And I want to call your attention that the bone graft that it was placed over the implant platform still remain and remodel over the implant platform. We published this clinical case as a, an article, it's the application of rap, rapid prototyping to improve bone reconstruction and mid dental restoration in the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry in 2017. Uh, how about case that the patient lost the papilla? As this case, this case was a big challenge for us. This patient lost completely the papilla between central incisor and the papilla was partially lost between central and the lateral incisor. Of course, there is no crystal bone in between these two teeth. And we have a huge difference between the current gingival architecture and the original one. This is a patient with a high smile line. And now, what can we do? And I wonder, if we strike this teeth, how would we solve this big trouble after that? So the question is, which is the treatment of choice in order to succeed? And I wonder, if we strike this teeth, how would we solve this big trouble after that? Maybe we can do the teeth extraction, guided bone regeneration, one more surgery, implant installation, Soft tissue graft, maybe two or three, in order to improve the, not only the keratinized tissue, but the papilla, the papilla creation. And one more surgery, implants and covering. Maybe between four and six surgery. But if you go through this way, through this sequence of the treatment, probably we would face with unpredictable of results. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing that, it was applied an orthodontic treatment. Uh, is low orthodontic extrusion. The orthodontic treatment lasts one and a half year, but we still have the crestal bone deficiency between these two teeth. And despite we have a good amount of available bone in both tuberosities, as you can see through this image, the patient lost completely the walls in both central incisors, number 11 and number 21. So we removed the braces, we took the impression, we got the stone cast, and over the stone cast, it was made the provisional restoration plus the surgical guide. And we customized the new emergence profile over this master cast. Let's follow the sequence of the treatment using um, a short videos. First of all, we confirmed uh, the loss of the buckle wall in number 21 and number 11. We measured the extension of the bone defect and height. We extracted this teeth as traumatically as we could. We had high mobility in these two, these two teeth. We, insert, we did the site preparation plus the implant installation. And the implants were installed three millimeters from gingival margin in the apical direction. This is the surgical guide that we used to insert the implant in the correct position. It was made the provisional bridge with the ideal anatomical contour ideal emergence profile, and we harvest bone graft from the tuberosity. All bone that we harvest from tuberosity, we insert in a container, rich in blood, as you can see here, and we start the bone reconstruction. And we use two pieces of cord who can sell us graft to restore the walls from uh, both central incisors, plus particulate bone. And we crush the remaining bone using a rounder, as you can see right here, in order to reduce the size of the particles. And we pack 
this particulate bond in order to fully fill these gaps, but it was missing to restore the crystal bond between these two implants. This is why we are doing here underneath the papilla an incision very careful. And we did the curettage, we removed the granulation tissue and we packed bone particles, just small particles using a bone compactor, as you can see here. This bone compactor uh, is part of the IDR kit made of titanium. This is what we did. We restored both walls plus the crystal bone and we installed the provisional bridge and we screwed this provisional bridge, a screw retainer. And digital aspect. And here you can see the new buckle wall completely remodeled between these two implants. And we remove this provisional restoration. And through this uh, occlusal picture, you, let's evaluate the periodontal biotype. In the implants, in the number 11 and 21, uh, we have a thick periodontal biotype, but in the neighboring teeth, we have a thin periodontal biotype. So it was taken impression made the two zirconia abutments over these two implants plus two single crowns and four contact lanes, porcelain contact lanes in the lateral incisor and the canines, the right and the left side. We checked this customized abutment over the implants and I want to call your attention to the new crystal bone completely remodeled and stable between these two implants. And this picture was taken one week after we delivery the final ceramic restoration. And this is the post-op after five years. You can see the balance between the anatomical contour uh, of soft tissue, uh, the papillae position, and the cervical area of the final restoration. Through this occlusion view, you can see the maintenance of the anatomical contour of soft tissue. This is uh, the patient when she is smiling. Remember in the beginning, we had a big, a big uh, defect to be managed. So we gave her back the self-esteem. We published this case 2018 as a multidisciplinary approach using slower to launch extrusion in combination with immediate dental restoration technique. It was published in the quintessence in Germany as well, in the same year, and in quintessence uh, in China uh, a, year, uh, a year later, 2019. To finish my speech, I would like to share with you this clinical case. This patient had a big mass, a large gene recession combination with loss of papilla, and we apply here uh, the cortical cancel, cortical cancellous graft in combination with connective tissue graft. Let's see what we did here. This patient came to my 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 friend's office in 2000, uh, presenting a large intercession plus loss of papilla. You can see here the crestal bone loss around 11 millimeters. Uh, and the dentist, the patient, the patient was concerned about to extract his two teeth. And my friends uh, suggested, why not to to try to, to, um, to save these two teeth, to do some uh, connective tissue procedure. Let's see what's gonna happen. So what would you do in a very challenged clinical case like this? Maybe if you do a teeth extraction, guided bone regeneration, implant installation, soft tissue graft, maybe two or three, plus implants and covering, we would expect some unpredictable of results. Talk about the gingival margin or, papilla, or papillary height position. Instead of doing that, uh, it was performed the periodontal plastic microsurgery. Uh, first of all, in order to improve the keratinized tissue, this is the surgery number one. This is the immediate post-op. It was collected uh, soft tissue graft from the palate. Post-op after seven years, this is the post-op after 10 days. After four months, it was performed. The second surgery in order to uh, do another connective tissue graft to change the position of the gingival margin in the coronal direction and to improve the papillary height position using again 
uh, microplast uh, procedures. This is the middle post-op. You can see here the new papilla and the soft tissue that was harvested from the tuberosity, sorry, from the palate. So seven years post-op, the patient was still complaining about the, the absence of the papilla and the, my colleague suggested him why not to do a papilla reconstruction. Uh, this is what he did. This is the incision that he performed. A, a reflected tissue and introduced uh, underneath the soft tissue, uh, underneath the, the flap, introduced the um, connective tissue. This is the post op after one year. Everything was working quite well for such a long time 18 years. Uh, the periodontal plastic pr procedures, microsurgery was performed by Glasgow Vasi Campos from Sao Paulo. Uh, in the same year, he called me and he sent this patient to me. And the patient presented here the fracture, the infection, the fistula at the buccal aspect. And you can see through this X-ray that we have the total loss of the crystal bone, 13 millimeters high. And now what to do, how to manage this? And we request the patient to take the CBCT scan. When we saw this picture, I, we were in state of shock because this, this patient lost completely the buccal and the palatal wall beyond the root apex. Mm -hmm. uh, it was confirmed to uh, the bone sounding. The periodontal pro probe showed us, showed us that we had no buccal wall and no palatal wall. And this, this two presented class three mobility. But how about the left, cent the left lateral incisor? It was remaining, remaining only partially the palatal wall, but the patient lost completely the buccal wall. And we have here the class two mobility. And we decide to keep the stiff in place, to save the stiff. What we did, we, we struck this tooth. We did a cur very gentle curettage in order to clean the socket as much as you can. Uh, and we, it was confirmed that we have no buccal wall, no palatal wall. And through this x-ray, we realized that we have no crystal bone, just a confirmation. And we went to the palatal area and we harvest connective tissue graft in order to improve the soft tissue quality around, around this area, but to improve also the vascularization in the bone, the bone graft. We harvest connective tissue from the palate. Uh, we, we did a suture right here. We, we added this connective tissue graft in order to improve the soft tissue quality and to improve the, the bone graft vascularization. We harvest from the tuberosity two pieces of cortical cancellous graft, as you can see the cortical layer and the, the, the cancellous bone. All bone that was harvested from the tuberosity uh, we insert in a container rich in blood and we start the reconstruction. First of all, we, we use buccal cortical cancellous block graft in order to restore the facial aspect plus the palatal cortical cancellous block graft and we restore the both sides, the buccal and the palatal area and we added and we packed only particulate bone graft and we use this, this particulate bone as a bone filler and we promote here a socket sealant. And we use particulate bone graft to promote the bone filling. We pack this graft using a bone compactor and here you can see that the socket was completely rebuilt and through this x-ray, you can see here the, the bone graft completely inside the defect. So it was performed, uh, the site preparation using oscillification concept in a counterclockwise rotation using the denser burrs. Uh, we, the bone graft was densified in the lateral direction and also in the apical direction. And we use this drill as a space maintainer and I want to call your attention to the three millimeters of the graft to, uh, to be left in the, bu in the buccal aspect. 
And here the question, we did the site preparation after bone break construction. Can we use this approach using biomaterial? Of course not. So the autogenous bone graft is the key in order to succeed. We insert the implant, the primary stability was 45 Newton centimeter. We insert here the titanium, the titanium temporary abutment. It was made uh, the, uh, the provisional restoration. And I wanna call your attention here to this X-ray. Pay attention, the height of bone reconstructed at the crystal bone in the distal aspect, more than one centimeter in height. We performed here the provisional restoration using the same porcelain crown from the patient. We just relined the cervical area using composite resin. And this is the immediate post-op, no bleeding, nothing. This is the immediate X-ray. Take a look at the amount of bone that was reconstructed between the implant surface and the root surface right here. And through this illustration, we, you can see uh, better wh what we did. We use connective tissue graft at the buccal aspect, the buccal cortical cancellous bone graft plus the palatal cortical cancellous bone graft to restore the buccal in the palatal aspect, and the mesial cancellous bone graft, only particulate bone, and the distal cancellous bone graft, only particulate bone to restore the mesial and the distal bone ridges. After six months, it was performed uh, the final impression and the final restoration in place, the final ceramic crown. And you can see the volume of soft tissue that we have, not only at the buccal aspect, but in between, between central and the lateral incisors. And it was reduced the mobility in the left lateral incisor from class two to class one. So here we can make a comparison. Uh, before and after periodontic plastic microsurgery and IDR technique. And this, <clears throat> here you can see the CBCT scan before and after. And I want to call your attention to the new crystal bone the, at the distal aspect and at the mesial aspect and make a comparison between these two CBCT scans before and after. You, you can clearly see here the new buccal wall and the new palatal wall. Uh, um, this is the, the book that was recently launched in Portuguese language, the periodontal and perimplant plastic microsurgery. It's going to be launched in English language in partnership with Quintessence uh, in a few months. And I wrote the, the chapter nine in partnership with them, the periodontic plastic microsurgery and immediate dental blood restoration. If you want to have more information how we did, please uh, just check uh, this book because it, the step-by-step -step is right there. What are the main advantages of using the IDR technique? First of all, the preservation of the natural biology. We use this piece of bone as a biological membrane to prevent cells competition between hard and soft tissue. Uh, the maintenance of gingival architecture is a flapless procedure. The reduction of the number of interventions is a single procedure. And of course, the reduction in the treatment cost. We only use autogenous bone graft. And how about the indications of the IDR technique? This technique is, uh, we, we may have a versatility. It, it can be applied in the reconstruction of one or more bone walls as you, as you saw in many clinical cases, uh, to restore one or several condemned teeth, the reconstruction of hard and soft tissue when we have bone loss in combination with gingival recession, the reconstruction of papilla in the crystal bone in case that we have the crystal bone loss, and to improve implant primary stability in case that we have low or no remaining bone. What are the requirements for the technique's success? First of all, knowledge in surgery, implantology, periodontics, and prosthesis. Training with the techniques as minimally invasive dental extraction, implant installation in fresh extraction sockets, harvest bone graft from the tuberosity, and the last but not least important, to construct the, the ideal emergence profile uh, of the provisional and the final restoration. This technique is a technique sensitive that demands training. You cannot apply this technique without training. This is why I suggest you 
to go for some of our IDR hands-on courses. This is a three-day three -day IDR hands-on course, a global training, two days theoretical classes that we are going to go deep in about, about concepts, what the literature has recommended to us for many years, uh, the evolution of the IDR technique in the last 13 years, and we are going to give you many tips in order to uh, be applied in your patient's mouth. So the two days theoretical class plus one day hands-on. As soon as you finish the three-day IDR course, you you'll be ready to apply this technique in your patient's mouth. Please be in touch with us. Uh, this is true address, email address, courses at brazodontologia.com.br and my personal email, Jose Carlos at brazodontologia.com.br. And this is the new platform, the IDR Online Education. This is quite new. Uh, this is in, in this IDR Online course, uh, we discuss about 20 topics. This is a two day course and lifetime access. It was recently published in, in recently released in Portuguese language and it's going to be released in English language very soon. At the most in one month, uh, we will announce this IDR online course, uh, two-day course, just theoretical part of the IDR technique. So guys, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention and for your patience. I'm still here for the most exciting part of the presentation that is the Q&A session. Please omit, come, come to me and let's start discussing about uh, some questions and probably you have some questions about this technique, isn't it, Omid? Yes, sure. I mean, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you so much because not only you, you describe the technique and you present it very beautifully and very comprehensively, but also your cases were mesmerizing. I was just thinking about <laughs> each of your cases, you know, like, what a case and what a management, what a results. You know, you showed from a simple case to a very severe case and all of them was beautifully managed and successful. And that's really important in techniques for, for, for all of us as a practitioner to say that one technique is good, it should be predictable and reproducible. An IDR technique is exactly the way it is as beautiful as you showed it because especially I wanted to have a discussion starting from the last case because it was just mind-blowing you know the way that <laughs> first of all the way that you reconstructed the soft tissue first on those central and lateral was something out of my mind it was very beautiful and my first question is regarding that how you should decide how we usually as a practitioner can decide to do the soft tissue grafting on such amount of exposed root surfaces because our main concern is the vascular supply to to the connective tissue that we are putting there and as i remember there was a very little amount of soft tissue available between two roots so but the success of your soft tissue graft was amazing because in two stage soft tissue grafting, you achieved almost all of the height of the soft tissue and it was maintained for many years. And then a fistula yes. happened. Yeah, these two surgery, uh, uh, surgeries weren't performed by Glassio Vas de Campos. He's a master clinician. Uh, talk about uh, micro surgeries. And he did the first, the first surgery was just performed to improve to improve the keratinized tissue. Mm -hmm. This is why he did the first surgery. In the second one, as we have the keratinized tissue, it was possible to perform another connective tissue graft now to, uh, to totally. change completely the scenario, to cover the gingival recession, and at the same time to improve the popular height position. I think, I think it was really interesting because because it shows that with microsurgical approaches and with, uh, with uh, highly skilled procedures, we are able to even treat 
class four Miller recessions. And that was very beautiful in your case. And speaking of uh, IDR technique, uh, which I believe that it's, uh, I think one of the most predictable techniques in, uh, in socket management and do reconstructions, as you mentioned and beautifully showed. Uh, my question is this, in, in uh, most of the cases, you place your implant first, and then you insert that uh, piece of bone from tuberosity inside the buccal aspect, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned yes. that you, you, do, you try to shape it in a way that to fit exactly in the area. So yes. we are placed that bone graft under periosteum. So you don't do any tunneling, right? No, no, no. no managing the flap, just inserting in a way that it should be. Yes, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, the graft is, is gonna be stable by just the position, uh, mm -hmm. by the adaptation between the graft, the configuration of the graft and the remaining in the remaining bone tissue. The, this is what we call the first and the primary stability. And the second and the final stability of this graft is obtained by the bone compaction using particulate bone graft all around the head of the implant. So uh, my recommendation is for the beginners, you cannot leave any empty space in between. If you left any empty space, you could compromise the result. So the tighter it's introduced, the better the result will be. And, and do you have any recommendation regarding the thickness of that plate? Yes, I have. Um, in, the, in the last five years, we've been working uh, and we've been teaching uh, the participants in the IDR course to take the bone from the tuberosity with the dimensions very compatible with the gap dimensions. So that means that you may harvest bone graft with the thickness around three millimeters. It's mm -hmm. much better, much faster, and you will need less bone in order to fill the gaps. That's amazing. As soon as we change a little bit the technique, not to change it, the concept in general, but we change uh, the way to manage compromised socket, always leaving a gap around three millimeters at the buccal aspect. So nowadays, we are able to take the bone with the thickness very compatible with the gap width. Yeah, exactly. So with the, with the point that you mentioned that if it's possible to have a thicker graft and then no need for putting the particulate graft in between because we filled it with all autogenous bone as one piece, uh, what, is, what, what, what will happen about the soft tissue gap? If we, if we fill the area with with all of it, with the, with the blood graft, with the tuberosity graft. What about the soft tissue gap? Is it gonna be a concern if we place a thicker graft to have less, less available area for soft tissue or doesn't have anything to do with that? Uh, the, depends uh, the indication that you have. For example, if you have a recession or extremely thin periodontal biotype in combination with infection, for example, it's recommended to use a triple graft in order to restore hard and soft tissue damage, mm -hmm. uh, to improve the, the soft tissue thickness and to do the bone reconstruction at the same time. But the main goal is uh, the bone graft, when we restore the defect, the bone graft has to be placed, has to be placed using minimally invasive approach. That means we can take bone using the, white, the, 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 the right tools and we can do the reshaping of the graft using the right tools. In this case, we use a rounder in order to cut the bone and we insert the graft at, 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 the, at the receptor site without leaving any, any empty space. Of course, it's recommend you to use magnification because in magnification you can see better. If you can see better, probably you have better results. And according to my point of view, this is what my, uh, this technique taught to me in the last 13 years is that the bone determines the gun position. 
If you have three millimeters of bone in thickness, you don't need to have any connective tissue graft, mm -hmm. despite you have gene recession in combination with bone defect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes, and Jose, one, one more question. Uh, I found it very interesting in the case, you pr your second case, with uh, two central incisors, which one of the gingival margins was more apically and had recession. So in that case, regarding implant placement and position of the implant uh, in a vertical direction, you mentioned that you placed the left central incisor three millimeters below the gingival margin but in the right central incisor, which had a gingival recession, you place your platform of the implant one and a half millimeters below the gingival margin. Am I right? Yes, you got it. And you're and, right. Yeah, and you let that space for the soft tissue to grow there. Yes, absolutely. This is what we believe. Uh, when you leave a space for soft tissue accommodation and growth, the soft tissue will obey the orders. Because if you have bone graft, high vascularized, the soft tissue will grow over the graft. This is why I recommend you to leave an under contour in the provisional restoration in order to allow the soft tissue to grow in that area. So Regardless you of the, uh, not only the extension of the bone defect, but if you have a gingival recession at the most 1.5 millimeters, you can do that. So my question was this, because you mentioned a very important point that I, that I didn't notice during the presentation. Uh, the fact is, because you used autogenous bone, that soft tissue can grow. If you use yes, graft, there is no way for the soft tissue to grow, right? Uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have in that clinical case, that particular clinical case, we have the combination with cortical cancellous graft, plus particulate bone. But we only use in that case uh, is small particles in order to fill the gaps. Most, in, in most uh, part of the graph was in one single piece, a cortical cancellous graph with the dimensions very similar to the gap width. Yeah, exactly. Well, your, your topic is truly amazing and truly magical. And I think I can talk about it like a whole day so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, want to say, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and i really recommend all the audience to to check this book it's amazing and also all the articles that you can go to PubMed. all of them are available you can check them out and also me myself personally i truly looking forward to join you in your hands-on course hopefully very soon and also very excited about the online course and i'm pretty sure most audience are so really looking forward to the english section of that to be open soon and so we can all join you all in the amazing online education thank you so much omid uh, i have to to say that i'm not a magician yes, this is not about magic it, it, it's about biological response uh, this is what we, we, we've been learning uh, in more than 10 years. Uh, if, you, if you give the options for the soft tissue or the hard tissue to grow, uh, we have just to, to trust in biological properties of this graph. This is why we select tuberose as the main donor graph the area, because in this graph, we may find the most important properties to bone repair process osteoconduction, osteoinduction, plus osteogenesis. And I have to say uh, many thanks for the opportunity to be here with you today. And I hope to see you in one of our uh, hands-on course to discuss a little bit more deep about this topic. Thank sure. you so much, Omid. Thank you so much for your time. Hats off. And really looking forward to see you very soon. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.